Good morning, everyone. It is six thirty. So today we will start a very important topic after learning how to handle a patient uh, at in the community, and then how to handle a patient when patient is at uh, this uh, home. Now there is a today. It's a very important uh, to learn how to handle a patient when patient is at home uh, because. we all know that uh, there will be a day the way non communicable diseases are increasing there will be a day when we will not be able to have enough beds in the whole over the world so we have to learn how to handle a patient who is suffering with a chronic debilitating condition when cure is not possible and care is required so how we can make the care medicalized and how we can give a best care to the patient at home uh, i think uh this will be uh, the today's topic will be dealt by dr stanley magadan and i think he is the best person to tell you how we can handle a patient at home when patient is suffering with some kind of a chronic debilitating condition uh i i really it's a honor to introduce dr stanley magadan I, i think he has got lot of degrees um, from india as well as from abroad uk uh he was an honorary palliative care consultant at bangalore he is a honorary palliative care consultant at bangalore papist hospital national coordinator of christian medical association of india and its palliative care programs he is leading a project india of international collaborative for best care for dying person uh, we uh, many of us are part of this project he has served in bangalore papist hospital for almost 27 years and was head of palliative care department he was an ex director of bangalore baptist hospital also he was a past secretary and national faculty he is still a national faculty of indian association of palliative care and he has served as a palliative care consultant in church of south india hospital bangalore responsible for geriatric ward and he is fellow of uh, palliative care uh, at, from north carolina university uh, usa and he has also served as a locum palliative care consultant in several uk hospices so when uh, i i was uh, a doctor stanley when i uh, 20 years back we used to hear that uh, you are in uk but you are you were coming in your connection with the indian palliative care committee you have never lost and finally you are serving indian palliative care community which really needs you a lot so i am really proud to introduce dr stanley and please learn carefully that how we can handle a patient at home and can provide best care who is in the imminently dying or who is in the advanced stage of their disease so dr stanley it's over to you thank you very much uh thank you dr sushma for those kind words of introduction am i audible yes you are you are clearly audible yes the screen is seen well okay yeah <coughs> so good morning everyone and it's a real privilege to be part of this learning process through iipc academy and i'm grateful to all the people who are involved in this exchange of the learning process today i'm going to talk on practical end of life care management at home that's the topic given to me so i will plan to go through some of these uh, uh, headings uh, topics that i have put here first of all why home care definition of end of life care we we'll look at some data on deaths at home and also the principles of good death we'll look at the proactive identification guidance from the gold standards firm framework in uk and we'll look at the end of life care policy uh, which is there for us in india and the practical aspects of how we can manage end of life care at home and finally how 
what we need to do to make good death at home a reality. So then first of all, why home care? Well, we know that everyone wishes to die at home. Most people all over the world would wish to die at home. So there must be a definite reason why this is so important. Home care helps to build a special relationship of trust. It facilitates frank discussion and communication, encourages personal autonomy and expression of wishes. When you go to the home, the person is the boss, you know, and we have to listen to him carefully. We have to agree to what he wants. So he uh, takes charge of the situation. He's in control. It helps to organize the family and also respond to their needs. We become familiar with the family. We know that family dynamics and we can help to organize them. It helps to empower the person and family and facilitate good death at home. This is very, very important. We, you know, the, the, the best outcome would be when we fully empower the person and the family. It avoids inappropriate care in hospitals and in ICUs. Uh, we heard from Dr. Navin the other day that delirium is less likely if the person is at home. And again, bereavement is better facilitated. For those who are left behind, bereavement is better facilitated. To be effective, home care should ideally, should ideally be a component of an integrated palliative care program. So, Go ahead, do Dr. Stanley. Dr. Stanley's mic also. Dr. Stanley's, your mic is muted. Okay, okay, thank you. Sorry. So, not a good question to ask early in the morning, but where do you want to die? If it's at home, you need to act now to scale up existing palliative care services by adding home care. If you want, if a preference is in hospital, then prevent possible torture in ICU by clear advanced medical directives and opt for management in a ward or in a room. If your choice is hospice, then there are not many, so you need to choose an appropriate one and be admitted early. A word of caution, please don't die taking a selfie. So let us look at some data regarding place of death. And you see on the left here in the UK from the Office of the National Statistics 2016, uh, in patients who are more than 90 years and also those with cancer, the two columns, deaths at home, 15 in the nine, more than 90 years and in cancer, 36. And uh, in the 90 year group, um, hospital deaths were again 41 and in care homes, you know, there were 43. Um, when we look, uh, there's a nice um, Cochrane database systematic review, 2016, which says home-based end-of-life care increased the likelihood of dying at home compared with usual care. So when we look at uh, the um, our own situation, our own data here in, in India. There's a nice uh, paper from Tata Memorial Hospital, uh, Liwal and Dr. Marian. Uh, home plus native place that's in their home care program was 57%. And again, when we look at our own data here in our country, uh, the other day, Dr. Uh, Mohan mentioned that in cancer support, you know, 95 plus percent of people die at home. And also in our, in our Baptist home care program, 97% of patients are dying at home. We are all familiar with this great lady, Dame Cecily Saunders. She was 87 years old when she died. But in 1967, she started the first modern 
hospice in the UK, St. Christopher's Hospice. And this picture on, on the right uh, shows, uh, is, is taken from one of her earlier patients. And you can see that the person here is in control and she is comfortable as compared to the doctor. And she is cover covered with a multicolored uh, cover, uh, multicolored what we call pallium. So uh, this summarizes what palliative care is, giving people control till the very last breath, keeping them comfortable with a multidisciplinary team is what palliative care is. And I've taken this from National Geographic. And this famous statement of hers, this again is very, very, it's a very um, honest statement, a very bold statement, a statement of commitment. And it's only when we do home care that we can truly identify with this. And if we don't do home care, then really we will not be able to say we will do all we can. We will not be able to say that, that we will do all we can to help them to die peacefully and to live until they die. And a, a very uh, precious moment for me in 1996, nearly 45 minutes to spend with this great lady. Again, we are all familiar with 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 this um, slide, uh, which is you know the essential components of palliative care: uh, symptom relief, psychosocial and spiritual support, teamwork and partnership, and communication, which keeps everything going. But the important thing to remember is that the aim of all this is empowerment: empowerment of the patient and family, and empowerment to harness their own potential. Everybody has been given, God-given potential to care, to care for themselves, to care for their family. And so by empowering them, we will be able to get the best outcome. Again, about these principles. So then we need to look at what our aim is, good death at home. So these principles of a good death, we are all familiar with. It was first brought out by the authors of Future of Health and Care of Older People, The Best is Yet to Come uh, in the London Age Concern in 1999. And then a year later in 2000, there was a BMJ editorial bringing out all these points. And it's very important that we are familiar with this and that all these are are more practical when we are doing home care because we have a lot of time to look into all these aspects and make sure that we are doing it. So then let us look at what is end of life care. Is it palliative care in general? Is it care in the last years, six months? Or is it care in the last two, three days? In fact, it is all these, you know, because last two days, uh, two, three days of actively dying merges into the care in the last six months or year, and it is part of general palliative care. But let us look at some definitions. And the one that I have always uh, looked at is from the UK, from the General Medical Council, because UK is the, the, the number one in palliative care in the world. And in this, we see that um, General Medical Council defines approaching the end of life as when a person is likely to die within the next 12 months. And the same definition is used by the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE guidelines and the gold standards framework. <coughs> Excuse me. So what does this include? <coughs> this includes patients whose death is imminent, you know, those who are dying within a few hours or days, but it also includes all these categories, advanced progressive incurable conditions like advanced malignancy with metastasis, <laughs> general frailty and coexisting co conditions. That mean that they are expected to die within 12 months, you know, elderly with frailty and dementias, existing conditions if they're at risk of dying from a sudden acute crisis, somebody with ischemic heart disease, and dying with the acute myocardial infarction, life-threatening acute conditions caused by sudden catastrophic events, you know, um, severe injury, uh, sepsis, uh, multi-system um, failure, 
all this will come into this category. Um, in 2018, Indian ICMR came up with this uh, definition in this booklet uh, on definition of terms in limitation of treatment and providing palliative care. An approach to a terminally ill patient that shifts the focus of care to symptom control, comfort, dignity, quality of life, and quality of dying rather than treatments aimed at cure or prolongation of life. <clears throat> now coming to goal standards framework. It's a framework to deliver a goal standard of care for all people nearing the end of life. It's about living well until you die. And it begins with a trigger that is uh, known as a surprise question that, and based on that trigger, uh, you know, you, you assess the needs of the person, the symptoms that he has, the preferences and the plan uh, preferences that he has, and you plan care on that basis, enabling patients to live and die where they choose. This is again a very important slide where <laughs> we need to be aware of the continuum of care, not only palliative care, but continuum of care in general, because it starts with preventive care, healthy lifestyle and everything is going on well, but then something uh, intermediate happens, you know, a heart attack or a <clears throat> injury, and then you need curative treatment and that is followed by some rehabilitation. But then uh, unfortunately a diagnosis of an incurable illness happens. And according to WHO, palliative care must begin as close to the diagnosis of an incurable illness. And also <clears throat> the it can continue alongside with curative intent and also rehabilitation going on for some time. But as time goes on, palliative care takes on most of the uh, aspects of care. And by the time of one year, six months, it is when people, the deterioration is started and end of life care is beginning. So according to NICE guidelines, the gold standards framework and GMC, end of life care has started. And then we have this uh, um, phase of actively dying, you know, the, the last two, three days of life uh, where we need to apply the integrated care plan for the dying. And in our Indian situation now, we'll slowly uh, move towards this Project India of the International Collaborative. And then palliative care continues as bereavement care. <coughs> And we are all familiar with these uh, three trajectories, which were brought out by uh, Scott Murray in his paper in 2008 from Edinburgh University. So the blue line, the cancer trajectory, the uh, organ failure trajectory, uh, the dotted line, and the green line of frailty. And we can see that end of life care is there towards the end. And in the cancer trajectory, it's a rapid decline in the um, Organ failure, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, there is no more for, no further reversibility and a slow progression down to death. And in the frailty trajectory, it continues in a slow manner and continues to <coughs> towards death. It's a nice paper from Dana Farber Cancer Institute from Harvard Medical School in which they found that patients with cancer who die in a hospital or ICU have worse quality of life compared with those who die at home. And their bereaved caregivers are at increased risk for developing psychiatric illness. So that was in 2010 from Harvard Medical School. The same thing is shown here. The yellow is home care and the red is ICU. And you can see that in all aspects, quality of life, physical comfort, psychological well-being in all these aspects, home care fared better than ICU or hospital care. <clears throat> also, there's a recent paper, uh, February 1920, of association between palliative care and death at home in adults with heart failure. So uh, most adults with heart failure die in hospital and providing palliative care near the end of life was associated with increased likelihood of dying at home. And they suggest that, the, that, that scaling existing palliative care programs to increase access may improve end-of-life care in people dying with chronic non-cancer illness. 
and we all know that chronic non-cancer illness is becoming more and more and this is a useful paper to tell us that home care really helps in this situation. Again, we are all familiar with this uh, <coughs> quality of death index and our terrible performance, 40 out of 40 rank. And you can see that all these aspects are mainly looking into, uh, mainly looking into the end of life care situation, the cost of it, the quality of it, the availability of it, and the environment of the end of life care. And also in 2014 was the WHO resolution, which is uh, asking nations all over to integrate hospice and palliative care into their national health services. Palliative care must be part of their health policies, budgets and healthcare education. And so 2015, when this was done with 80 countries, our ranking is 67. And so to, uh, to facilitate early referral to palliative care is what the gold standard framework uh, aims at, you know. It is trying to be proactive in identifying people who need palliative care. And it, it goes through three steps. One is surprise question. Step two is general indicators of decline and increasing needs. And step three is specific clinical indicators related to the three trajectories. So the step one is the surprise question. And this is what the clinician who has been taking care of the person or the, the, like a cardiologist or a nephrologist or a geriatrician or a physician who has been involved in this patient, he's the best person to, to deal with this surprise question. To ask himself, would you be surprised if the patient were to die in the next year, months, weeks or days? Uh, so he asks himself this question and if the answer is no, I will not be surprised, then that's the time to refer to palliative care so that we can take all measures to improve the patient's quality of life and prepare for possible further decline. <clears throat> Here is uh, um, regarding this um, um, systematic uh, review and meta-analysis of uh, the um, how accurate is the uh, surprise question. This was done in 2017 and the meta-analysis showed the pool accuracy level was 74.8%. There was negligible difference in time scale because some people looked at six months and some looked at uh, one year. The doctors appeared to be more accurate than nurses in recognizing people in the last year of life. Uh, and the surprise question seemed more accurate in the oncology setting uh, as compared to the other settings. Again, in um, 2019, there was this interesting paper which says screening with the double surprise question helps to uh, identify people who are deteriorating uh, and uh, in whom death is likely. Uh, so they stuck with the surprise question first, which is as usual, would I be surprised if this patient were to die within 12 months? But they added another surprise question, question two, which is, would I be surprised if this patient is still alive after 12 months? And their conclusion is that this double surprise question, um, uh, surprise question appears as a uh, appears a feasible and easy applicable screening tool in general practice, and it's highly effective in predicting patients who need palliative care. So step two is looking at the general indicators of decline, and. These are all uh, listed here, general physical decline, uh, repeated unplanned hospital admissions, advanced disease, complex symptom burden, significant multiple morbidities, and spending uh, uh, poor functional performance, uh, spending more than 50% of day in, in bed and increasing dependence for most activities of daily living, decreasing response to treatments, decreasing reversibility, and patient choice for no further active treatment, uh, progressive weight loss more than 10% in past six months, uh, sentinel events like, for, like a fall or a bereavement or a transfer to nursing home, and then the deterioration starts further, and serum albumin of less than 25 grams.
And then finally, it has step three, which are specific clinical indicators. And it starts, and it is with all the three trajectories. So, so the first trajectory is the cancer trajectory. And again, here, um, it helps to identify these people. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a little uh, example of what we did uh, of achieving this using the gold standards framework is to have a combined clinic, you know, of, we called it the Palong Clinic, Palliative Oncology Clinic. And we presented the seven years experience in the Lucknow IAPC conference. And you can see that we have the patient and her uh, uh, husband, and then you have the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the treating surgeon. Um, you can see Dr. Raji there. Uh, she was spending her time with us at that time and the DNB students. So all of these people together sitting and trying to and the nurses there. Uh, the second <laughs> trajectory is about the organ failure, which includes heart disease, COPD, kidney uh, disease, general neurological diseases, Parkinson's disease, motor neuron, and multiple sclerosis. And then the third trajectory of frailty, frailty and dementia and stroke. So all these things are there for you to look at and uh, we can get it from the <coughs> Uh, Go Standards Framework uh, website. <clears throat> Another common question that the family will ask you when you are at home, mainly you know because they have time to discuss and sit with you, is how long do, do they have? Of course, they ask this question anywhere in the hospitals also. And I find this uh, guideline by Dr. Twycross very helpful. That is, if they are deteriorating from month to month, we di we discuss with the family about their about the deterioration of the person. And if he's deteriorating from month to month, then perhaps he has months to live. If he's deteriorating from week to week, then perhaps weeks to live. If deteriorating from day to day, then perhaps only days to live. However, days can become week, weeks can become month, months can become year. In other words, this is a, a, a rough guide. And so what you need to encourage people is to, to do everything as soon as possible. So explore the wishes of the person and assure they will be respected, explore concerns and do something about it, explore fears and allay those fears by reassuring the person that it will not happen. And even if it happens, they will get the absolute care that is necessary. And then also we need to keep in mind that we need to identify people who could be dying in the next two, three days. So the diagnosis of dying is important so that we can guide the family properly. So they could be physically wasted, profoundly weak, bed bound, maybe drowsy or going on to coma, or they may have very limited attention span, maybe disoriented, sometimes with uh, delirium also, unable to take tablets or great difficulty with swallowing. Uh, they, they have little interest in fo uh, food or fluid uh, there is altered breathing like chain strokes or no noisy rattling breathing or breathing with uh, long periods of apnea and signs of reduced cardiac function. Example, mottling of skin, cold extremities, tachycardia and weak peripheral pulses. So all that is good, but what is the reality? What is the reality in our, in our country? And this was well brought out by Dr. Priyadarshini uh, in our paper in 2014. 83% of healthy Indian population prefer to die at home, uh, uh, but mostly they die in hospital. 78% of patients with advanced illness left hospital against medical advice. And all, almost all patients who left against medical advice did not receive any form of symptom relief measures and died miserably. <clears throat> this is happening even in the wards. Patients are dying in wards and at home with no symptom relief health-related communication or support. And significant number of patients also die with advanced illness in ICUs with needless inappropriate interventions than most of the time. Uh, patient, and these patients are dying alone in pain and in distress. So what about the cost? Is dying costly in India? More than 80% of healthcare spending in India is out of pocket and maximum amount of money is spent on investigations in the last uh, weeks of life. And out of pocket spending pushes nearly 55 million patients into poverty every year due to healthcare expenses. 
So this requires a huge attitudinal shift among all healthcare providers, especially us as palliative care, and to see how we can change the situation. And so in, in, in all this gloomy kind of situation, there was this ray of hope. <clears throat> and this was by the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine, or the intensivists in our country, who came out with this paper in May 2005, nearly 15 years ago. But this paper never saw the day of light. And they were telling us how to limit life prolonging interventions and provide palliative care towards the end of life in Indian intensive care units. So all we had to do was thank them and take on from where they had left. And this is what was done. Nearly nine years later, we were able to join hands with them and then come out with this, our own position paper on end of life care and a joint position paper uh, defining end of life care policy and an integrated care plan for the dying. Now this is available and this is what we should become common practice in all our ICUs all over the country. <clears throat> and this uh, joint uh, statement uh, brings out all these important guidelines. These 12 uh, points are there and it begins with the physician's uh, objective and subjective assessment of medical futility and then consensus among all caregivers, then honest, accurate, and early disclosure of the prognosis to the family, giving them time then to make their decision and, and making further decisions based on shared decision-making process, and then uh, having good documentation <clears throat> and ensuring consistency among all caregivers, and then impl implementing the process of withholding or withdrawing life support. And then from nine to 12 is what palliative care takes over, but we could also be involved in, in the earlier um, steps for any discussion or talking with the family along with the intensivists. <clears throat> and uh, in progression of this, we also became a member of the International Collaborative for Best Care for the Dying Person. This was in November 2015. And the key principles for best care of the dying uh, patient is one is recognition that the patient is dying in other words diagnosis of dying then communication with patient wherever possible and always with the family and loved ones spiritual care anticipatory prescribing review of all clinical interventions and discontinuing what is not in the best interest of the patient uh, looking at hydration review nutritional review and full discussion of the care plan with the patient if possible and relatives, of course, and regular reassessment and dignified and respectful care after death. So we had the first foundation course in January 2016 in the Bangalore Baptist Hospital. And the progress so far has been that first of all, we achieved congruence of our document with the key principles of the international um, collaborative and then publishing of feasibility and acceptability of implementing the integrated care plan for the dying in the Indian setting. And this is mentioned here and also an editorial uh, uh, promoting this. Then publishing of the Blue Maple document from Mahi by Dr. Navin Salens. Uh, initial pilot projects were done in Baptist Hospital and Karnashreya and were presented in the IPC uh, Project India meetings. Further pilot projects are being planned in few centers. And right now there is a Delphi uh, International Collaborative Delphi study regarding consensus on core components of best care for the dying. So if anybody is interested, they should uh, also take part in this. This is just to give you a, an example of the close working with the intensivists. You can see here Dr. Atriya Ganguly from WHO and our intensivist, Dr. Uh, in the Romanian <coughs> Deepa Das, along with our palliative care physician, Mary, uh, Dr. Amy, and uh, uh, um, Dr. Ashita, uh, who was doing her 10 year, 10, 10 days clinical attachment from Maharashtra, uh, doing the National Fellowship in Palliative Medicine program. <coughs> now I want to talk about uh, the subcutaneous route. This subcutaneous route is uh, very important in our home care management. 
oral medication we continue as long as possible, but when a person can't swallow, retain medicines, or has erratic absorption, like an intestinal obstruction, we need an alternative route and subclinical route is the best route. It is as effective as the IV route. Maybe there's a delay of about 10 minutes for the effect to happen. Combination of meds for various symptoms is possible. It's simple to use, can be easily taught to family and carers. Emergency kits provided with necessary medication and instructions. Uh, using, uh, using a 10ml syringe, butterfly needle and cannula. Subcut injections are given every four hours and as needed in between. Syringe drivers are not practical in our home care. So we have improvised it by empowering family and we call it the family driver in honor of these great families who are willing to be involved and in taking care of their loved one. <clears throat> and families truly empowered and can be supported 24 into seven by the palliative care team. <clears throat> the next few slides are just to show you quickly as to how we have progressed in this uh, use of subcutaneous route. <clears throat> We first presented a four-year experience in 2003 in the 8th Congress of the European Association of Palliative Care in The Hague in, in the Netherlands. And then in that same year, in 2003, in our Indian Journal of Palliative Care, we put up a position statement regarding family giving medication at home. And we also uh, were involved in a nice discussion in our palliative drugs uh, dot com bulletin board with the uh, uh, editor Andrew Wilcock regarding the family driver and it is available there for you to look at and then again uh, in 2007 this was published in our journal and uh, the main thing is that giving medication at home by family is accepted practice in palliative care this is by the Indian Association of Palliative and then in 2007, we got this best poster award in the uh, IAPC conference at Tata Memorial Hospital. And it is, was about feedback by families on palliative home care service. And then we also in um, 2009 presented this paper in the LCP conference in London, where we brought out the important differences between the UK and the Indian version and the role of family especially the role of family in the Indian version. We also presented this in the IAP con Trichy conference in 2010. And all these details we, um, are there for you. You can click on the link and you can look at the poster in detail. And then in 2019, again, going down the years, we had a best poster award for these combined clinics and joint ICO consultations. For, care, for a seamless care of older people approaching end of life. And then in the, in the most recent Guwahati conference, we had completed 25 years of palliative care and we brought out the best practices, which included subcutaneous route and the family driver. <clears throat> so the family driver, here you can see, uh, the, the syringe driver is there in the picture and the family of the patient, the patient is in blue, and in the right upper slide, the family is being taught by the nurse. And then in the same visit, the family is made to do. And then we, we are made, we are sure that they have learned and this can be followed up in subsequent visits. And the outcome is a comfortable patient at home. So some differences between uh, family driver and the syringe driver are all here. Family driver simple, whereas syringe driver complicated. It is easily taught. This needs special training. It is low cost, low tech. It is high cost, high tech. One ml of combination given as regular four hourly intermittent injections and one ml PRN. And in this, you have continuous infusion, subcutaneous continuous infusion. So in the family driver, there may be some peak and trough effect, but the therapeutic range is maintained as in the oral method. Whereas in the syringe driver, you have a consistent therapeutic range. We can use same combinations that are used in the syringe driver and we can omit those if a person is too much sedated, you know, whereas in a um, syringe driver, it is not easy. You may have to stop the infusion and restart. And so that's not very easy. Additional meds can be given at the same time. 
uh, and in in the screen driver this may be possible through a port but again it or it may need a separate site <clears throat> uh, family driver relies on personal involvement you can talk to the family driver whereas series driver becomes a bit uh, tech, uh, technology takes over and it's most appropriate for our home situation not appropriate for our home situation uh, the series driver is not appropriate so some suggestions for our use in the indian context uh, we use the subcutaneous route not continuous but intermittent regular and as needed and is given by family at home so we call it the family driver and in a 10 ml syringe you can take two ampules of morphine that is 30 mg injection midazolam 5 mg two ampules injection haloperidol two ampules injection of ranitidine 50 micrograms uh, 50 mg two ampules so all that makes up to 10 ml and Uh, family is advised to give one ml of this combination every four hourly and in between as needed. So they can start with six a.m., ten a.m., two p.m., and so on. And we can also give a loaded syringe. So a loaded syringe will have six regular doses and four PRM doses for twenty-four hours. And in a separate five ml syringe, we can give injection Kitorolac, thirty milligrams, two ampules, and you can give one ml of this subcut every. 12 hours or every 8 hours for the musculoskeletal pain additional meds can also be given by the subcut route as needed for severe anxiety and breathlessness and panic we can give injection lorazepam we can give we also use lorazepam tablets both by the sublingual or mucosal route for rapid palliative sedation especially in the context of the pandemic and people dying at home Uh, we can use 15 mg morphine 10 mg midazolam and 10 and 10 mg of haloperidol in a 5 ml or a 10 ml syringe and give 1 ml every 10 to 15 minutes till the desired result is obtained injection fentanyl 50 micrograms per ml can be given subcut for uh, prn for severe pain especially incident pain or pain before, before doing a dressing and things like that Injection hyoscine butyl bromide, twenty milligrams for colic pains or for secretions, noisy breathing. We can give injection furosemide, twenty milligrams subcut for pulmonary edema and it can be repeated. Injection phenobarbitone, twenty milligrams subcut prophylactic twice a day if if there is possibility of fits. Also, levetiracetam, five hundred milligrams in in hundred ml of normal saline can be given as a subcut infusion over thirty minutes. And we can also use Dexamethasone, eight milligrams subcut, if we want to reduce peritumor edema. There have been some interesting editorial in the BMJ in 2020 because of the pandemic and stretching of their the services. They have uh, come out with this saying: prescribers are now being asked to consider drug administration by family caregivers when community nurses and doctors are not available to administer end-of-life drugs in a timely way. and they say there's good evidence for effectiveness of subcutaneous injections of drugs such as opioids and midazolam at the end of life and uh, again in march 2020 we have this excellent guidelines from the scottish palliative care uh, guidelines uh, it says regular bolus subcutaneous administration of a single medication or a combination of medication is an effective way to manage symptoms when there is no syringe pump available or no trained nursing staff or in some areas where family carers can be trained to give regular medication so this is what we have been doing over the past two decades and it is nice to know that uh, these things are being advocated now we have to look at bereavement care also as part of end of life care at home and end of life care allows this important aspect of anticipatory grief counseling you can see the counselor here talking with the patient trying to reassure him help telling him about that, that the family will be cared for and that he will be kept comfortable you know those things and then you get into this uh, grief cycle uh, and uh, we need to remember that there is a lot of variation in, in how people grieve and they can uh, oscillate between the various uh, stages 
And the final goal is that the pain of separation, the yearning, the, the pain of separation is, is replaced slowly by the joy of remembering. So in our uh, bereavement program, we have in the first visit, uh, at the time of death or during the special location for the departed, we do all these uh, things. Uh, and in the second visit, around six to eight weeks, we, we do all what is listed here, uh, especially uh, trying to see if there is any abnormal grief and to, to look into any aspects of social or rehabilitation for the person and any health education that is needed. And this can also be done. Second visit can be a phone visit. And the final third visit is usually um, annual memorial service where they light a candle uh, in, in memory of their loved one. And nearly 50, 60 percent of our, of our families attend this uh, program. Now, another important aspect is death verification and certification of death at home. Uh, any registered medical practitioner can verify death uh, after seeing the body. He need not know the cause of death, but he can look at some of the papers and if cause of death is possible, he can mention that. But otherwise, he just has to verify that death has happened because only then that the, 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 the family can inform other relatives and the funeral process can be carried on. And you need to notify any necessary and uh, take any necessary precautions if there's an infectious condition. Uh, there is no need to mention cause of death. May refuse if any foul play is suspected. And then the proper death certificate in Form 4A is filled by the treating hospital doctor stating the cause of death and this can be used for registering death with the corporation. And again, here we need a good standardized process all over the country, especially in the rural areas. So uh, this is my uh, slide, uh, a plea, a kind of uh, what we call uh, home, take home uh, slide management. Uh, let us make good death at home a reality. And this we can do by advocacy and scaling up of our palliative care services. We know that uh, Dr. Sushma has been in close contact with the Ministry of Health, with Dr. Alok Mathur and others, and with the WHO, and a lot of important uh, for progress we are making. So we need to continue with advocacy to make palliative care an essential service in all healthcare setups. Uh, and we need, we have minimum standards put out by IPC and the Clinical Establishment Act. Another important thing is advocacy for mandatory palliative and, and end of life home care service in a five kilometer radius around every healthcare setup. There are so many healthcare setups, nursing homes and hospitals in every city. And if they took care of five kilometer radius around their hospital, the whole city can be covered. Uh, we have a national palliative care strategy 2012 and we can use it as applicable. And we have this end of life care policy, integrated care plan for the dying, which has been published in, our, in the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine Journal. And we need to have 24 into 7 advisory support by specialist palliative care team. And this will be the backup that is needed for most families. But also, as Dr. Anil Paleri mentioned, you can have out of hours emergency palliative care service, either as an extension of your own program or by networking with another group. And public awareness and community volunteer support, like the neighborhood network in palliative care model, and community volunteers training, because that's a huge resource which needs to be utilized. And we have the WHO 16 hours curriculum for that and involvement of local GPs in the same area. And I'm glad, glad that Dr. Um, Srikanth Athriya will be dealing with this integration with general practitioners. So I've given you some useful uh, publications in the UK and also in India. And certainly you need to look at the uh, palliative care position paper by IAPC with regard to the COVID pandemic. And this has got a nice video which shows uh, made from made from Baptist Hospital, which shows about the subcutaneous medication. So it's a huge challenge, a lot of things to be done, and we all need to encourage each other. And also we need motivation and encouragement and guidance from above. And for me, the encouragement is through Lord Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. He says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And Jesus' love compels me to be competent compassionate and committed in serving the suffering and dying and allowing them to die peacefully 
with dignity and hope. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stelio, for wonderful presentation. Wonderful. Now, I request... Uh, Questions? Yes, please go ahead with the question answer. Ah, okay, thank you. Uh, Stan, there are some questions I'll ask you. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. One question is, can a palliative care doctor declare and certify death during home visits? Yes. Um, you have to do it on your own letterhead because you cannot give the hospital or the institutional uh, death certificate. But as a doctor, after seeing the body, seeing the body is very important. And yes, because you've been involved with that patient at home, you can give a death certificate. Uh, in fact, what we are trying through the uh, end of life care task force, uh, bringing out some of the uh, kind of a document for legal support is to bring out this difference between verification of death and certification. What we need is verification. Any registered medical practitioner can verify that, but after seeing the body, and then they can go ahead with the with the um, funeral arrangements and all that. And then the cause of death can be, and the death certificate, proper death certificate can be obtained from the hospital doctor who was treating the patient. I hope that answers. Yeah, I think uh, so. But uh, will that be applicable throughout India? Yeah, that's what, again, you know, all these things are the things that are important. We need, a sta I mentioned that in the slide that a standardized process all over India is important because especially in rural areas, there is a lot of differences, you know, as to how this certification is done. But anyway, things are happening. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, because we get a lot of phone calls, no? Because yeah. these are practical problems. Yes, yes. And people have taken the dead body to the hospital to get a death certificate. I think that is totally unacceptable. Yeah. Okay, Stan, we go to the next question now. Yeah. Uh, what is the best agency to set up and provide home-based end-of-life care? Is it the hospital? Is it a government agency or shall it be an NGO? Or NGO yeah. See, all these are different possibilities. But I think the best possibility is to have a full integrated program. In other words, if it's an institution, it's a hospital, a nursing home, or um, yeah, a healthcare setup, then you have an integrated program in the hospital and you extend into the community as home care. So that will be the ideal. But then if you are doing a freestanding like a hospice or a freestanding home care, then you need good networking and making uh, you know uh, this care possible. But then in that, that, that continuum of care is not ideal. You know, so the ideal situation is a fully integrated program and this can be done. All you need is a small palliative care team in every hospital, make palliative care an essential service, make home care an essen uh, a mandatory service for five kilometer radius. You know, so that's possible. Okay. Uh, thank you. Next question is, thank you doctor for extensive lecture. Uh, what are the best practices you can recommend for end of life care for patients and families during COVID? Any guidelines you want to say? Yeah, again, here, <clears throat> I want you to really look at the guidelines which has been brought out by in our IAPC newsletter. And it is also published in the journal, uh, the response of IAPC with the, uh, in with regard to the COVID pandemic. It is a must read for all of us in palliative care because a lot of good uh, uh, suggestions and documentation is there. And if you follow that, there is also excellent uh, this thing on home care by um, sister from Calicut and myself and a video on palliative care. So it is important that you look at that and all your questions will be answered if you look at that. Okay, so the guidelines from this. Right? Yeah. Uh, sir, there's a question about uh, subcutaneous infusion device. And the question is at what max, it's a bit generic question, at what maximum rate can subcutaneous infusion be given to the device? Yeah, see, I have no experience with the subcutaneous infusion. The only infusion that we have done is to give 
palindromic acid, uh, you know, in 15 to 30 minutes at home. Uh, but otherwise, we rely completely on this intermittent regular method. And uh, there are some uh, ways of giving what we call um, fluids, you know, and that is about 500 ml to uh, one liter of fluid slow, uh, slowly uh, uh, at the back, you know, or in a suitable place over 24 hours, you know, a slow infusion. So exact rate, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because okay. it's difficult to know that. Yeah, no problem. Uh, because Brother Rajasri has uh, written down some uh, rates, I think. So that is fine. And uh, so there is one last question. Uh, just see whether this is in the scope of the seminar. The question is, role of ASHA workers in early identification of patients who might need end of life care in the community. Any thoughts on that? Yes, uh, we need to, you know, just like we can empower the patient and family, we should also empower all the others. You know, all our knowledge and skills must be transferred to whether it's an ASHA worker or a, a simple person who is helping the, the patient at home. You know, they need to be fully clued, you know, and their skills must be developed. And it is very easy, very easy to take care of the hygiene of a patient, very easy to make sure that he doesn't fall. All these things are very simple, but more important is the attitude, how we look after the person, you know, whether we care for them with the compassion that we would have for our own loved one. So when they do that, you know, the, the, that thing really works. And the person is so helped because maybe his uh, dear ones, his children are all abroad or somewhere else and they're not there. So the, the ASHA worker or the person who is helping the person at home becomes the child who is uh, taking care of him. And there is a wonderful relationship that is developed. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, uh, there are a lot of questions, a lot of comments congratulating you, Stan, and rightly so. We have and covered most of the, the majority of the questions have been covered. Sosha, madam, would you like to say something? Just a minute. So thank you, Dr. Stanley. Uh, I think it was a wonderful presentation. There are still a lot of questions and Arun is very smart. And uh, I think he is very, uh, because we start in time. So we want to finish in time because we have to go for other, uh, we, it's a Monday day. We have to work and everyone will have to go for the work. And I think there are a lot of questions and I request Nisha to forward it to you and I think you can answer them individually. Yeah. Oh, individual people, they can ask questions from Dr. Stanley on his phone or whatever way you want. Sure, anytime.